Uh, we are told is at risk of explosion at any moment. Joining us now is Matt Dempsey. He's a data reporter at the Houston Chronicle's investigations team. He just last year reported an eight-part series on chemical plants in Texas and their dangers. Mr. Dempsey, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us tonight. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, what is the latest on that plant in, uh, in Crosby and the, the possibility of a fire or an explosion there? How, how big of a risk do you see this in terms of your, your knowledge in this field? So from what we know right now, um, I just actually spoke to the Harris County Fire Marshal's office. They said that they don't expect like a shockwave kind of explosion. That's in contradiction to what the UH expert says, who thinks that we're sitting on a powder keg type situation here. So I have experts on one side saying it could be a huge thing, and I have the government, government officials and the companies saying it might not be that big, so it's hard to tell for sure. Um, we do know that they've tried to evacuate everybody from the mile-and-a-half area, that um, apparently you can't force people to leave their homes in Texas. So I do know that there are some people in that mile-and-a-half radius that have, not, that have chosen to leave. So we don't know what's going to happen to the homes and the areas around it, but we do know that the mile and a half radius was set to be conservative and try to protect as much people as possible. And Matt, where you're describing that disagreement there between the, the fire marshal and other experts that you've talked to, it sounds like they're disagreeing on how big and what the character will be of the explosion when it happens. Uh, as, if I'm yeah. reading you correctly, you're, there's no disagreement as to the fact that there's going to be an explosion. Oh, yeah, there will be a fire or explosion. It will be very surprising if there isn't. They don't I think they have the ability to get back into that facility for at least six days because they have over six feet of water in that facility. So in the meantime, they're stuck waiting. They can't monitor the temperature for all of the refrigerated facility or refrigerated containers that are holding the organic peroxides. So they have no idea when the temperature is going to get too hot and then it's going to cause an explosion or a fire. So that's why they evacuated everybody last night, and they're honestly, a lot of people were just sitting and waiting. Mm. Um, you asked that question today um, with the Arkema CEO about um, whether or not he would release the inventory, essentially, of what chemicals were kept on site now that that's no longer something that people have public access to uh, in the state. I thought it was remarkable that he refused and said he saw no need to do that. Uh, it, did you ask about that because you believe that there might be information in that inventory which would help make decisions that would preserve human health and life here, that it would help make decisions about the appropriate radius for the evacuation, that it might help prepare for the type of explosion or chemical reaction we'd be expecting here? Honestly, what I was doing when I was asking that question was trying to figure out if we could get an updated form. I have a tier two from 2015 for them when we did our chemical breakdown project. But when we sent out letters to that facility, because that facility was listed as one of the highest potential for harm facilities in the Houston area at the time. They told us that they reduced the amount of cumene hydroperoxide. It's one of those organic peroxides that they have. That they, they said they reduced the stores of those chemicals dramatically. Uh, when I asked them how much did they reduce it, they said, we can't, don't want to tell you. And I said, well, I can't verify that you reduced it dramatically if you won't tell me. And they said, well, you'll have to trust us, essentially. So I was hoping we could get an updated form so I could see how much cumene hydroperoxide they had and so we could have a better job of seeing whether government officials were making the correct decision, whether the company was making the correct decision, whether they, whether they were being 100% honest about what they have on site. I thought it was, I, I'll be honest, I was surprised as, as you were that they didn't provide it. Mm. What, what do they have to lose at this point? They don't look good already because of the situation that they have. Right. And um, I guess that's, I mean, it's scary to be thinking about just waiting on this thing to explode. Um, putting aside the damage that may or may not occur because of a fire or explosion, uh, what's your sense about how, damage it's, uh, about how damaging it may be just to um, have this plant be so damaged by what's about to happen? How toxic is this stuff? What type of uh, other facilities are around it? Are we looking at something that's going to be an environmental uh, or sort of pollution crisis even after whatever happens with the initial fire or explosion? Right. Um, actually, just a bit more than two miles down the road from the Arkema facility, there is another chemical plant called Chemco, KMCO. Um, they're also on our high potential for harm list. Um, that's all based off of analysis we did with Texas A&M University. 
Um, and it's based off of the chemicals that they had, how much of it they had, and the number of people that were located within a two-mile radius of the facility. So that's why we determined that that plant, that Arkema and this other plant, KMCO, um, why they're considered a high potential for harm facility. So I am kind of worried that the, their highest, um, sorry, their worst case scenario that they listed with the EPA involved two other chemicals, um, if I remember correctly. Um, sorry, I'm blanking right now. Uh, isobutyl, I, I don't want to get the chemical wrong, but essentially it's two other chemicals that weren't organic peroxides. And the fear was that those tanks, if they ruptured, would have an environmental concern. Well, I'm assuming if a fire and explosion happens that those tanks might rupture. And that worst case scenario they listed with the EPA, literally it lists out that those were, that worst case scenario was considering, considering perfect meteorological conditions. Oh. Well, we're far past perfect meteorological conditions at this point. So there is a lot of concern. Uh, just a quick point to, I heard from a number of experts who wondered why temperature was their only way to keep um, this organic peroxide safe. Um, at least two experts that I talked to said that they should have had, and it would have been standard operating procedure for a facility like this to have some sort of compound, compound to quelch the organic peroxides, essentially make it so that it, the explosion risk, fire risk, was not there. Hmm. The problem is it would, re, it would eliminate that stock so they wouldn't have it for product going forward. So they didn't do that. I don't know why they didn't do that. I haven't gotten a good answer from Arkema about that as this point, at this point. Um, I don't know if they didn't have a compound on. Maybe they weren't following pr procedure according to these experts. But I find it troubling that they said they planned for a worst-case scenario, and the storm just ripped right through that. Matt Dempsey, uh, data reporter at the Houston Chronicle. Um, oh, you, I've, I've followed your work for a long time. You always do very good work. Right now you're doing work that is very, very scary uh, to hear about, even from this distance. Thank you for helping us understand it, and I appreciate it.